good evening. So I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's um, the regional school committee meeting and the joint school committee meetings for Dover and Sherburne. And so I am calling it to order at 703. Just to let everybody know, the phone's going to ring. Oh, there it is. This is Lynn. Perfectly. So a member of the regional school committee is going to call, is calling. Hello, Lynn. Hi. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks, we have Lynn. remote access. So let's, oh, here we can put her name tag right oh, good. on the phone. Very good. So Lynn is here and phone only. Um, so we're going to kind of shift things around a little bit because we have a lot of presentations. So we're trying to move this as quickly as we can in the interest of time and in the interest of teachers who have come to present and administrators. And I, I see I have a large uh, public contingency. I never realized that it was going to be so much fun to go to a school committee meeting, but here we all are. So we're going to hear public comments, but first we're going to um, deal with community comments. But if possible, and this is going to be strange, I know, I would like to um, do the public comment portion with any public comments that do not relate to school start time committee. I know this is strange, but we're going to do a school start time presentation, and then we're going to have public comments after that because maybe some of that will answer some of your questions maybe it will make you think of another question i'm just trying to not have us duplicate the process so if that's okay and in the interest of time and efficiency i'd like to handle it that way so first are there any public comments unrelated to school start time uh i've got one okay uh i'm john kubi 11 stage coach okay um, the bus runs on Hartford, and when my when my kid gets picked up, my son Nicholas, um, it's fine because he gets picked up on you know the he doesn't have to cross the main street of Hartford. Okay. And when he gets dropped off, he's got to cross the main street of Hartford. Now the bus for my daughter comes up the street. You know we've got a circle you can turn around on. Can we just have him come down the to the circle to drop him off rather than? And this is in Dover, correct? Yeah, 11th okay. stage coach in Dover. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't see. So are they in the same, it's the same, it's well, the same, I, bus. same bus, but at not same age time, not same drop off times, I would imagine. Right. So, so that's something that um, we can right, look so into. Uh, the, the main the central office, if you um, send that to us, we can, we can look into that. We handle that at central office. Okay, central office is right. where? Uh, so Trisha Schmidt or John Pretori. Uh, is that here in the middle school or? No, no. no. Um, so if you look at business manager, um, if you just send that to me, we can deal. We can look at that with time. Sir, I can write down the email address, give it to you before we leave. Uh, it'd be perfect. Uh, Do you want to go ahead you. and write it? Yeah, I'll, I'll get it right now and send it to you. I'll okay. give it to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. So next, on, on our agenda, the way that um, we're going to handle this now is we're going to go ahead and heal, hear about... Um, the seal of biliteracy. So we have people here who are going to present that. Beth, Beth is going to present that for us. So is that on screen? Mm -hmm. um, it was already provided um, and it's done by the state. So um, I am here this evening to just share information about the seal of biliteracy. Um, I'd like to introduce Beth Ferris, who's the director of World Languages for the high school. And Chris Lesko is our English language uh, learning director for the district's pre-K through 12. Um, and so the idea is to share with you the fact that uh, there is an opportunity to provide our um, seniors as they graduate the state seal of biliteracy, either as is or with distinction. The idea is that we are recognizing students who have high levels of functional and academic proficiency in English and another world language. Um, this was put into place by, in 2017 by Governor Baker with the idea that we are um, recognizing the importance of being multilingual in a global society. Uh, and that we realize as Americans in general, uh, we have a long way to go in, in terms of becoming bilingual. So this is an incentive for schools to really push their programs and expand their programs and make sure that all students are involved in languages. So Sherburne should be proud in the fact that seven years ago, you started the PLUS program at the elementary level and that continues to come up through the system. So we've made a lot of great growth in that regard. Um, it's also an opportunity for students through a standardized measure across the country um, with an objective um, person listening and interacting with them to be able to say that they're proficient at a certain level um, within the proficiency continuum. So just as oftentimes we'll get resumes that say that someone is 
um, proficient in Excel or in Excel or proficient in Word. What does that really mean? That you've used it once or that you can do, you know, all sorts of fancy calculations. This is an opportunity for students to say, I am proficient at the um, intermediate high level in reading, writing, speaking, and listening in both English and another language. You know, as I mentioned, I think it coincides well with our class program, um, the proficiency model, which we have started through the work of Laura Romer and the class program is now moving into the middle school where teachers are really focused on the kids using the language in class. And it's more about using the language to get your thoughts and ideas across versus um, worrying about the grammatical structure and the accuracy of it. Um, so it supports that. Um, it supports the WeRDS initiative and the fact that we have 32 languages spoken in the district. This is an opportunity for students who speak another language at home to be recognized and validated for that within this community. Um, and I think it also speaks to our current focus on making sure that our students are prepared for a college, career, and life. So happy to address any questions. This is more informational. We will have to come back to the regional committee at a later time. Um, and happy to talk further um, about potential implementation at the state level. Right. This is something for the region that would go into, uh, likely go into the program of studies, but so, it does impact all three committees, which is why Ms. So McCoy wanted to mention that. If I've got questions that are more specific to the region, should I hold off until next month where we talk about the program of studies? I just worry that Jeff and Chris are here tonight, and right. John is the uh, okay. so it might, it might be so worth I, asking. So I can ask. Mm -hmm. um, if you thought about the impact, or what do you perceive might be the impact of the Latin program? Because it wouldn't be a seal of my literacy because they don't speak it. It would actually. They can they can prove oh, can? literacy through the OERA test. So uh, most of the languages that we interact with both within our program um, and most of the languages our students speak at home uh, will be tested the Apple test, which we already used with our fifth graders last year. Mm -hmm. um, we've done it with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and now we're going to be doing it with our eleventh and twelfth graders this year just to kind of get a benchmark. Um, but yes, it, uh, Latin can be validated through the OERA test. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. What, um, in terms of just the anecdotal data that you have probably collected already, or maybe, what, um, to what degree are our current language programs at the different levels of the high school um, likely to already be meeting these criteria? And what do you think the impact, like, what percentage of kids today do you have any idea would already be getting these if they take the four years of the language versus how would we rigor up for kids who? might be interested but um, wouldn't necessarily get to that point. Um, so that's what we plan to do this fall is to okay. do some testing of our, uh, we chose to do the juniors because many of the juniors may be at that level, I shouldn't say many, mm -hmm. a number of the juniors may be at that level at this point in their study um, with the ultimate goal of they would apply and, and in the future seniors would apply in the fall of their senior year, mm -hmm. they would Set, uh, they would arrange to do the testing. We would have to set that all up as to when we do it and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the results are sent off. We get them pretty quickly within a, a, a couple of weeks or less. And then that would be it. And if they reach the level, they, they get awarded the seal. Um, and so it's pretty simple. Yeah. It's not real complicated. Um, would there be a cost, like for AP and all this, there's a cost to students, both in times of money that they pay and also they come at various times to take these stuff. Would this be included in their education or would you anticipate charging the students for this seal? So at this point, we're proposing that we would uh, charge the students for the seal, which is $20 to take the test. Um, however, of course, there'd be scholarships and support available to anybody who would need it. Um, and would that be something they would have to seek out or would, would you like... I just want to make sure that, like, particularly for students for whom, you know, there are more and more tests, right, like available, and I just want to make sure that we're not forcing kids to go begging who might need the help, that we would have a way to make sure that it's not, like, <coughs> you didn't know you could ask for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think, you know, even um, this fall as, um, or I would say next fall if we're given permission to begin this program, Jeff and I would, would visit all of the language classes, the world language classes, and make sure that um, juniors and seniors are aware of this program. And then with Chris's support, students that we know speak another language at home, we would also make sure we have conversations with them to know what their um, their options are. Um, many of the languages our, our students speak are offered through the Apple test or the Alira test. Some of them are not, and in that case, we would have to work with um, a, a list of certified folks that the state is providing who speak uh, other languages and the students would do a portfolio to prove that they can read, write, listen, and speak at you know, 
that level. Um, and that's something that we would probably start with them their junior year to make sure that they have enough time and ease to get the work done if this is something they want to pursue. Uh, I guess piggybacking off of Maggie's question, um, is has there been any thought or concern around whether this could potentially be a, a stress inducer for kids who, students who maybe they're not quite there and they really need to jam in more, more study or more tutorial or something else in order to achieve this? When we talked about this at the Academic Standard Committee, which is um, the high school leadership and the department heads, there was concern that is this going to work against the ideals of challenge success and is this adding another standardized test to the measure? And I think that's when we scaled back from looking at the pathway programs, which starts giving awards for language attainment starting in elementary school all the way through to say this is something you do your junior or your senior year. You know, these are the benefits. You know, look at it in terms of your long-term goals and whether or not it's worth the time and effort. Um, you know, the students also will continue to take the AP exam in many of our languages and perhaps they just, you know, use that in their transcript as proof and, and they'll feel confident enough. You know, I think one of the questions you probably saw in the literature too is as they're starting to have these conversations with colleges with the hope of eventually students being able to gain credit for having, you know, completed a foreign language requirement or a world language requirement. Um, the conversation is just starting in, in the world of employment and industry. So again, we have to make sure that students realize that they don't need to, to spend 30 hours cramming for a test if in the long run they don't feel that this is something that's going to benefit them. One of the um, possible ways to show achievement or, or a proficiency is to get, is it four or five in the AP exam? <laughs> but they don't get the, those results until July of af after they've graduated. So this would be one possibility uh, if we set it up in such a way that they could do the testing before they submit those um, applications to colleges, which is November 1st is at the early, so it would be before that. And the, the results we get are, the, the Apple, um, the service that provides the Apple test does it very quickly. So it's within a couple of weeks for the speaking, which people actually have to listen to and evaluate. Mm -hmm. And then the reading and uh, listening comprehension are done automatically, literally. It's instantaneous. Going back to Ms. Sharon's question, too, about using this data as um, kind of uh, an evaluation of our program, I think it is valuable data in that uh, our, our elementary students and now our sixth graders are so used to the proficiency model where they can speak very um, with ease and confidence in their language and uh, you know the middle and high school are transitioning to that model mm -hmm. so I think it's going to be important over time to make sure that our students continue to be able to speak and listen whereas we know anecdotally our students are very good at reading and writing in a language but don't have that confidence and this mm -hmm. will give us the data to say we need to do more speaking and listening in class to really move those scores ahead. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Anything you wanted to add? No, I, I, I uh, you know, I'm excited about the fact that um, our students who've been enrolled in FLES for the past uh, five years and now are moving up to sixth grade this year, you know, they, they're going to be able to have one more way to demonstrate a proficiency and share that with the schools that they apply to, which I think is excellent. Unfortunately, the world's getting more competitive mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's, in my opinion, in, consistent with our uh, challenge success practices to try and find ways where kids can demonstrate their proficiency without, you know, having to go over the top. Mm -hmm. This is something they'd be getting credit for that, that they've been doing along the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. So next is our presentation on Finland. So. Um, so that's here. Uh, I'm just going to load that up. That is going to work with the principals on this. Awesome. I will just say, Actually, just for um, folks uh, in the audience and for our school committee members, uh, this year we had a, a pretty unique uh, opportunity. I don't know of any other school systems in Massachusetts that have ever been able to do this uh, in that uh, the Dover Sherman Education Foundation supported all five of uh, all four of our principals and our assistant superintendent uh, for a trip to Finland. Uh, Finland is uh, by, uh, by many accounts one of the most progressive school systems in the world, extremely high performing and yet um, does not depend on uh, heavy duty assessments, homework, uh, provides the kids lots of recess. Very, very interesting uh, model. 
And so we're thrilled to have uh, the group of, of administrators who went here tonight to talk about it. So I'm just going to pull the um, presentation up. And uh, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our findings. Um, we're very grateful for the, to the DSEF for um, funding this educational tour. And uh, while we have already, already presented this information to our faculty pre K through 12 at the opening of school, we're hoping to share our findings with you because they coincide very much with what we're talking about with challenge success um, and the future of teaching and learning in the district. Um, and we'll also be doing this presentation for the greater um, parent community um, and Dover Shore community on November 13th when we have an evening with the superintendent. So I will just begin by saying that as you all are very well aware, our strategic plan, uh, two of our goals focus on the social emotional wellness of students and staff, and the other on making sure that we maintain the excellence and rigor that Dover Sherburne is known for while we evolve our educational practices to make sure that we're preparing our students for this world that is evolving even faster. Um, so that being said, there are so many examples of things that Dover Sherburne does well already. Um, so that being said, this year through our professional development program on early release days, um, our teachers are sharing some of those practices um, with each other. I'm um, sorry, can, I, can you move forward oh, a sorry. little bit? Our remote person can't hear, yeah. unfortunately. Can you get near one? Or you could grab a mic. Grab a mic. Grab a mic. Just grab, grab one. Yeah. There you go. OK. So, um, We'll go back to the last slide. So we, there are so many things that we want to celebrate in the district. Um, our full day of professional development, um, that Monday after Thanksgiving, um, many of the staff will be sharing strategies that they've been using. She can't hear you. Yeah, make this with the camera. She's here. <laughs> um, so I apologize for having That's my fine. back to you. You're, we have it out. Okay. You're good. Um, so perfect. December, perfect. Perfect. thank you. December second, our full day of professional development. Our our own faculty will be sharing the many practices and strategies that they've been using in support of social emotional wellness and um, and innovation with each other. Um, However, that being said, as we've been talking about, Dover Sherman operates with a growth mindset. So we realize there are perhaps areas for us to grow and evolve as well. So in thinking about that and saying, well, how do we learn what we don't know? How do we know what we don't know? Um, and how do we perhaps uh, learn from others? We decided to think outside the bubble. And as Dr. Keo mentioned, Finland, by many different measures, is ranked at the top of school systems um, uh, in the international world. So why not go there and learn from the experts there and bring back the findings here? So DSCF um, sponsored our trip. We went in July. Um, and our principals are here this evening. Thank you for coming out after a long day uh, to share some of their findings with you and how it's going to impact teaching and learning in all four schools. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. <laughs> Kellett, uh, headmaster of Dover Shelby Middle School. Thank you. I'm just stand no, right up here. As you can tell, I'm the one on the left. <laughs> that was late in the trip, so I had already indulged in a lot of the food, <laughs> uh, which was fantastic. And I'll touch on that in a second. Um, this is actually in Estonia. It was just a, we took a day trip over there, and it was spectacular. Um, I I want to thank DSEF on behalf of my colleagues. It it was just the experience was fantastic for a host of reasons. Um, most importantly, what we learned about their education system, um, but also Beth for being the ringleader and keeping us in line and, and having everything so well organized. The um, one of the, yes, please. One of the things that, that stood out about Finland and, and leads into how the schools operate is the culture. There is an incredible sense, strong sense of community and family. Uh, and this starts when the, when, when the kids are born. The uh, communities provide the, the families of newborns with the baby basket, with the essentials. They have check-ins, periodic check-ins with the families, and uh, they get families that can split it up between the, the parents, 18 months of paid maternity leave, which takes a big burden off them. And at uh, age of three, the families have the opportunity to get childcare at a cost that is uh, determined, it's affordable uh, preschool, that's determined by their income. It's pretty amazing. The other thing about that 
lends itself with the families is they get a month off in the summer and most of these families have modest homes either on the mountains or on the shores and they get to go off and have family time um, and from all accounts from the people we talked to over there it is invaluable as i mentioned before uh here you see a, a nice picture of family this this is from we went to a fort out off helsinki and one of one of the group took a picture of the the geese which i think was very telling of everything we saw in Helsinki itself when you'd walk through the food courts and downtown, how families interacted. Um, I think one of, I don't know whether it was our group or our, our friend from, our adopted friend from Holliston who was with us on the trip, um, who said, you never saw a parent scolding a child. It was just very, everybody was calm and it was, it was very, very eye-opening. Um, the the other piece that that is really big in finland is the food we had the um, opportunity to go out and try new things many of us some of us were adventurous mm -hmm. and that would uh have the opportunity to try either blood red so bread blood red reindeer sausage or reindeer heart mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> uh, some tried some didn't <laughs> if you're there you have to try it right um but we also had the opportunity, the, our host, who will be joining us next week, uh, Gaitre, uh, he had us to his home and, and cooked us a, a native dinner. And he was emphatic about the significance of food in their culture. And he explained how each of the, the meal uh, entrees and various parts of the meal, what role they played. Um, we're really lucky that he's coming next week, uh, and we look forward to giving him a similar experience. My thinking, unfortunately, it's closed, was, would be to take him to Durgan Park <laughs> to, to get the real feel for the art culture. Um, the other, the other piece in the in the in Finland is the role of the church. The church, it, it has the uh, they've taken on the role of, of creating a culture and a safe society that recognizes every person for their inherent value. And to that end, they, they, are, they provide counseling for families, uh, both family counseling and also professional counseling. So they're there for them if, if situations arise. And then this picture here you'll see is, uh, my wife and I traveled beforehand and we got there early. So she arranged a, a tour, a historical walking tour of, of Helsinki before the rest of the group arrived. And we had a young college tour guide who was very good. We, it was a spectacular tour. And we, at the end, she goes, I want to take you to my favorite place in the city. So my wife and I are thinking, oh, it's going to be a beautiful church. There are unbelievable churches in Helsinki or uh, a garden or something fantastic. What she took us to was a library that was opened in 2017. It was, it, it was just spectacular from my, from my lens. It is not a library as I know a library. It is a destination place. There are people of all ages. It is not quiet. There's interaction going on on all floors. There are areas where you can get a quiet space to, to meet and, and study. Um, but there are also cafes, two cafes. There was a uh, deck outside of one cafe that you overlooked a big park. In that park, there was a turf field where kids were all playing. A short walk away, there, were, there was a pond with bike paths and walking paths around it. It was just a place where people of all ages went to. Just, it, it's, it's I, I don't know, I'm, a, I'm speechless as to, um, how impressive it was and it speaks to their culture and how it's all about the individual well-being and to me that feeds into their educational system which now my colleagues will will follow up on thank you thank you so dr barbara brown from pine hill school is going to talk about student autonomy so when we were over in helsinki we got to meet with folks from the ministry of education and we got to visit schools and meet with administrators, uh, educators, and best of all, students. Uh, in Finland, students have greater autonomy for their learning. 
uh, compared to the United States, students had much more control and responsibility for their own learning, both in terms of what they learn and how they learn it. Students we met showed initiative and talked about how they monitor and evaluate their own, their own learning along the way and access their teachers as coaches when they feel stuck or uh, feel that they need more uh, practice to master skills. Uh, we were super impressed with how self-aware the students were of their learning. The principals, teachers, and students we met all conveyed the, appoint, uh, the importance of trust. Learning from mistakes and allowing students choice is integral to their pedagogy. Uh, the, the, in Finland, the curriculum aims, as they call them, aka curriculum standards as we call them here, place emphasis on developing human, human beings versus uh, just teaching students. In Finland, they did away with fragmented knowledge taught under the traditional subject-based approach, and they identified skills and competencies that students can generalize to the real world. Competencies and skills are embedded within topic-based instruction. They're learning things like uh, cultural competence, interaction, self-expression. They focus on taking care of oneself, managing daily life, and also on competence within technology and working life. Uh, there's an emphasis on building active skills that students will need for the rest of their lives, such as entrepreneurship, participation, involvement, and creating a sustainable future. Um, the number of languages they spoke were impressive, and the students' awareness of global learning uh, was super impressive to us. Um, uh, Scott mentioned that Petri, our host, is coming here to work with our uh, DS educators next week for three days. We're very, very lucky. And part of what he'll talk about with our educators is the concept of phenomenon-based learning, uh, which is central to the Finnish instructional pedagogy. Learning starts with the goal of understanding a real-world phenomena. Students have to investigate the phenomenon by asking their own questions, we call it inquiry, uh, researching facts and delivering answers and solutions. Teachers guide them through the process, scaffolding the steps and helping them through the complexity, uh, but they are in no way uh, teacher-centered. The lessons are flipped and they're very student-centered. Uh, content knowledge is integrated throughout the topics that are explored. They're not taught in isolation as we do in the US. Uh, less is more in Finland. School starts at age seven. The simple idea here is that teachers should talk less and let students do more. Uh, teacher facilitated, teachers facilitate the teaching, as I mentioned, while the students set their own targets, they reflect and solve problems, and they evaluate themselves along the way, of course, with teacher feedback. Uh, teachers also stimulate uh, student curiosity by studying environments in environments outside of the classroom, such as forests or shopping malls or uh, the schoolyard, uh, public library. Um, they, they, <clears throat> they're not just as, as classroom-based as we are. Uh, Finnish schools don't regularly assign homework all the way through high school. Uh, it is assumed that students master concepts and skills at school Homework serves a practice for kids that feel that they need more practice uh, in order to achieve that mastery, but it's definitely not um, the volume of homework that we assign in the US. Uh, brain breaks are valued. Uh, for approximately every 45 minutes of instruction, students and teachers have a 15 minute break to decompress, to relax, to continue conversation about what they've learned. Uh, and the idea is that they're recharged by the time the next lesson starts. Only one nationally standardized test is administered when students go into the eighth grade. Accountability rests with teachers and learners. It's not top down uh, per the government like it is in the US. Uh, and in DS, we're really excited to take these concepts. Uh, we're using classroom space design and curriculum assessment and instruction reviews to consider ways 
uh, that we can increase student choice within learning and play times at the elementary level. Thank you. So Headmaster Smith is up next. All right, thank you, Dr. Brown. Good evening, everybody. And I also just want to thank DSEF, and I also want to thank members of the community who uh, provided funds to DSEF to afford us this opportunity. I am thoroughly grateful. It was a fantastic trip and certainly something that I'm very proud to represent Dover Sherborne High School. Um, teacher trust. What you know, during our trip, we obviously saw a lot of cultural sites. We were able to take in tremendous amounts of history, beautiful architecture. Uh, but one of the neatest things that we got to do was to actually visit the National Finnish National Board of Education as well as a private high school in Finland. And we learned a lot from those uh, administrators, those teachers, and those students. Um, the meetings we held at the National Board of Education, which was a fantastic, beautiful, sort of open, modern concept space, epitomized what the Finns believe in education, the inclusiveness, the belief that uh, new and creative, innovative ideas can be brought together by almost everybody, that everyone's in on this. So while Finnish schools have national standards by which all schools must follow, you know, here we have Common Core, and we have our MCAS tests, and we have lots of lots of uh, standardized testing that takes place. The level of autonomy which was given to schools and teachers was really striking for me. Uh, in our discussions with the educators and their supervisors, the word trust kept coming up frequently. Principals said that they trust their teachers. Teachers would say they trust their students. Parents trust their teachers and their students. And there was really this inclusive process by which everyone really worked together in a positive forward motion. They, they, they certainly had flaws, and Petri would be the first to say there are certain some things that we don't do well. All systems uh, have their flaws. But they had a very positive attitude about innovation, a real positive attitude about everyone being involved in the process, uh, communities, <coughs> teachers. And because of that, teachers were held in very high regard. In Finland, becoming a teacher is the equivalent to becoming a doctor here. Uh, in many cases, it's pretty close in terms of the number of uh, years of schooling. Uh, most of their teachers don't go in front of uh, students until they at least have already obtained their master's degree. Uh, and some have gone on to doctorate degrees and, and other um, additional masters. Um, like American teachers, they're charged with the greatest asset that their nation has, and that's their students, their people. That's their greatest resource. So as a result of this level of trust, they expected that teachers would be highly trained. They expected that teachers would be at all times professional and do what is right for students at all times. Um, teachers and, and principals reported that teacher evaluation was more about mentoring and supporting rather than checking off boxes and completing um, reports. And that was really fascinating because we said, okay, what happens if you have a teacher who is struggling in the classroom? And they said, intensive monitoring takes place and mentoring because we have invested a lot in this teacher to even be in front of a student. So as a result, we want this to work for everybody. Uh, students were uh, often allowed to uh, learn by what's called phenomenon-based learning, which Dr. Brown talked about which is really just a much deeper look into the study of education. So they might take on a problem, and looking at that problem, they may use various disciplines to help solve that problem instead of going from class to class, like we might do in a traditional high school, they instead would have more of a laboratory type of process. Um, this approach obviously allowed students to go deeper. You know, sometimes we do talk about that, that we kind of just skim the surface and we have to keep moving and keep moving some of which is because of the bureaucracy of our standardized testing and our standards and our common core. They, on the other hand, have a lot more freedom and flexibility to really dive deep into subjects, which we found that for the students we spoke to there, they thoroughly enjoyed that because they felt like they could really pull apart what it is they were learning. Um, in addition to that, I think that they also developed a, a much greater global concept of their world and what role as students in Finland, albeit a very small nation, they saw their role as a very large global role. And if you've been following the news recently, you know about the young lady from Sweden uh, who has been making international news for climate change. 
it's that same type of attitude where they feel that real moral responsibility to take on the challenges that are presented to us in our, in our world today. So while I believe that we have an excellent system here and we have tremendous support, you know, one of the things that I'm focusing on this year at the high school is greater teacher trust and also, but more importantly, telling my teachers to trust our students more, to allow them to dive deeper into subjects, into areas, and to explore. I think that can simply just make us a better school. Um, one of the phrases that kept coming up all during our time there, and I was fascinated, so I bought every book I possibly could on it, <laughs> is this phrase called Sisu. And Sisu basically translates to, uh, they call it the art of, uh, fin the Finnish art of courage, but it also dealt a lot with resiliency. If you know anything about Finnish uh, history, they've been occupied twice. The Swedes and the Russians have occupied them over uh, numerous um, centuries, yet they are incredibly proud. They don't hold grudges for that. They're very resilient. We know that their climate can be quite harsh, and yet they are some of the most positive, humble, quietly confident people that I've ever come across. Uh, so I think that there were a lot of lessons that we could learn. So if you want to learn anything more about Finnish culture, I highly recommend going on to Amazon and just grabbing this book. You can read it in about half an hour, uh, but it touches upon everything from education to culture to history to food. Um, they're a pretty amazing society. And um, at, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Dial, who will talk more. Thanks. Good evening. I, w I want to echo what my colleagues have said about the incredible opportunity that we have and how grateful we are to DSEF for providing us that opportunity. I wanted to share with you about the impact of the environment and as you've heard from us, the entire experience of going to Finland really had an impact um, on what we're doing this year as well as the mindset um, of, of people within the district. Uh, so the, the people in Finland have this incredible respect for the environment, even though uh, it can be, in terms of temperature, uh, very, very cold and drastic, um, a, tr a true respect for the environment, and that's embedded in their culture. And it moves beyond nature into community and education. And they consciously think about shaping their environment to improve their lives and their educational system. Uh, one example of that is they have a lot of their learning taking place outside the classroom. Uh, they have these authentic learning experiences. They're hands-on. Uh, we've talked in this district for a long time about <coughs> project-based learning. We're hearing more about phenomenon-based learning. The kids are learning directly from nature, experimenting with what is there, um, and, and taking those lessons to heart. It's also a great way to collaborate and discover things with their peers. And there's a lot of social learning that happens in the environment because they're given that flexibility and that freedom to really explore. Uh, and so we are, we are adding more and more of that into our system here. We had the, uh, the pleasure of meeting with Timothy Walker when we were in Finland. He's an educator who started his career here in Arlington, Massachusetts, uh, met the love of his life, and moved to Finland. Uh, he was very, very candid and has um, a blog where he shares with the public his experience here in the U.S. and his experience in Finland and some of the differences that help us understand how to move our system forward and how to cre create a, uh, a more positive and a richer environment for our students. Um, he talked about shaping the environment. He talked about the importance of these breaks during the school day for students and also for faculty members. Uh, there's, there's a tendency, I think, for many of us in whatever uh, work we have, when we have a little bit of free time, we're catching up on our emails, we're catching up on that, that brief communication. What's so important for all of us is to have time dedicated to interacting with one another to really either either thinking at a higher level or taking a deeper dive into the work that we're doing. Uh, and so in Finland, they really value that time for educators to come together. In Finland, that often happens in the teacher's lounge. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of really good work that happens in the teacher's lounges here. Um, at the elementary level at Chickering, uh, we we decided to redesign what we have there uh, to make it a, a more pleasant environment where people will come to collaborate. 
Uh, and, and we're really saying this is important and there's so much that has been pushed into the educational day, all good things, but it has put a stress on the system. And so we're consciously thinking, how can we create that time for people to come together and, and do the good work that they've set out for themselves? Um, so we have been, um, we looked at, at Timothy Walker's book, we can follow his blog, and that was um, a benefit, especially because he has a lens on both educational systems. So I think I've touched on many of the things that we took away from Finland and that we've carried over. Um, and I just want to thank you again. And I will turn it over to Beth for the last part. To Great. Thank sum you. it up. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so many of the lessons that you uh, heard our uh, headmasters and principals touch upon are listed here. Um, and as you'll notice, um, please step forward. You know, we've been working on many of these things for many years. Uh, before Andrew and I got here, the teachers were working on differentiated instruction in the classroom. We've been working on challenge success for six years. We are DS in recognizing ourselves and the importance of the individual within a community and recognizing the differences and celebrating the differences that that individual brings to the DS community. Um, and, and that idea of respect um, has been the last few years, cultural responsiveness and looking at the more global perspectives um, and making sure that our students understand the world outside of Dover, Sherburne, and Boston. Um, our core values certainly speak to many of these things. The portrait of a graduate in draft form speaks to many of these things. And now Finland and our, and our learnings there uh, reinforce many of them. So while people are saying, oh, it's another initiative, actually it's the same things being touched upon from another lens. So that being said, moving forward, um, again, we'll be continuing to celebrate the many things that Dover Sherwood already, already does in support of those lessons and those ideals. Um, as well as you know, continuing to pave a path um, with the supports of um, our leadership. We have uh, teachers doing many professional development opportunities already. Um, our elementary uh, folks uh, work with the responsive classroom this summer and looking at the social dynamics within their classroom and really building that classroom community and empathy. Um, we're continuing to work with EDCO and the IDEAS initiative to make sure that our teachers are trained in cultural competence uh, and making sure that they're supporting equity um, inclusiveness in their classroom. And just as we have the opportunity to travel, our teachers have the opportunity to travel either to the classroom across the hall, the classroom across the river, um, or farther away to begin to, to look at some of these practices and bring them back to DS. So that being said, we will continue to work on the social emotional wellness of students and preparing our students for the future um, and the road ahead. And we hope that you will join us in that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to take questions, but that was that was lengthy. If you would like additional information or ask questions, you can ask us privately or come to the November 13th event with Dr. Keo. Yes, so we'll take a much deeper dive into it. Um, I failed to mention that I also have been to Finland myself. I didn't just pass on this and send the administration. I went and was uh, truly influenced uh, by it. And uh, I would argue that I still am to this day. So. Uh, so thank you very much. We hope you guys can come on the second and uh, we will go from there. Okay, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Administrator. <laughs> So I don't know if anybody has been to Pine Hill, but they now have a um, hay maze. Of, I don't know if you saw it on Twitter that they made for the kids to go outside and play and try to wander through. It is cool. It's up to it. So next, finally, I know this is what everyone's been waiting for, is the school start time presentation. Nobody's going back down yet. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Sorry. Let, let Kate do it. She, she doesn't have to hop over. No, I got to do it. I said I'm blocking. Okay. I won't walk you in. Just hang in there with me for a second. Hold on. I can look at this on my computer. I'm just going to sit Okay, so, um, so as you know, uh, last year we went through uh, a very detailed process of developing the Start Times Task Force. Uh, this was not a new thing for us. Actually, it started in 2016 uh, under uh, two superintendents ago. 15, 2015. Sorry, 15. Two superintendents ago, um, this this uh, concept was examined, and uh, that group, uh, some of of whom may be in this room tonight, uh, took a very deep dive into the research, into what was happening out there. Uh, 
And to that end, when I came here for my entry, uh, I, I interviewed as many people as I possibly could. Teachers, parents, kids, community members did research on what, what the school had uh, written into their uh, school improvement plans, what kinds of things mattered to the people of Dover Sherbert. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, this came up. It came up again and again and again. And that's why it ended up in our strategic plan. And that's why we went back to looking at it again last year and developing the school start times task force. So um, what I'd like to do tonight is you know, we, we went through that process and went to April uh, of 2019, last April. And I presented a proposal to uh, the three school committees and uh, which was accepted to make a start time change. And what I want to do tonight is talk about the work that we've done since then in preparation for this transition. So um, these are the start times that, uh, that were approved. So you can see, uh, hopefully you can see those slides, um, that the elementary start times uh, under this new model would be 7.50 a.m. Uh, Secondary start times would be 8.35 a.m. Uh, the dismissal time for the elementary schools would be 2.15. And uh, at the uh, secondary level here at the region, 3.10 p.m. And, um, and then the projected bus pickup times at the elementary levels would be 7 a.m. or later. And uh, the, at the secondary level, the bus pickup times uh, in the morning would be 7.40 uh, or later. It's important to, there's some important points I want to make about the elementary start times because this topic comes up a lot. Um, so Dr. Judith Owens, who many cite, many, many cite, if you go to any school system that's uh, in Massachusetts anyhow, that's looked at revising their start times. She's somebody who's frequently quoted. She's the director of sleep medicine at Children's Hospital. She suggests that there's a sweet spot for elementary school aged students, that it's not um, a, an exact science. And that's what makes something like this so tricky because everyone's individual child is different. Um, but she believes that the, the sweet spot start time for elementary schools is between 7.30 and 9, 9 a.m. And interestingly, I did not mention this when I came to you last spring, but I thought it was worth uh, mentioning tonight that we've actually um, done some research about local independent schools. Uh, we don't hear much about their start times, but we're just curious because actually in Dover and Sherburn, we have quite a few families who actually send their children to independent schools. And um, we found that Pheasanton School, for example, had a 7.50 a.m. start uh, for pre-K through nine. Uh, they've been doing that for 21 years. Uh, 10 Acre, uh, Country Day, a 7.50 arrival, an 8 a.m. instructional start. That's a pre-K through 6th grade school. And Milton Academy has an 8, 8 a.m. start for pre-K through 12. So I just thought that was an interesting thing to point out. So the Start Times Task Force, in its original form, as you, you recall, was really intended to do the research, see what the other group had done, in 2015, make sure we weren't missing anything, consult with experts, bring experts out to speak to our community, provide people in the community with as many opportunities to hear about what we were looking at, survey people. We, we had a lot of responsibilities with the Start Times Task Force and communicate what was happening. It was a lot of work, and I am truly grateful to the members of the original Start Times Task Force for all the time and energy that went into that, because these are big decisions. The second phase of this that we talked about in the spring when we met in June was that this task force now needed to start to prepare for this change. The decision had been made in April. It now needed to prepare for this change. That's a big, big ask, but it's a very different ask. It's, it's, and that's something that I'm, you know, that we're learning along the way. The Start Times Task Force Phase Two is learning that this isn't so much about uh, having parent coffees. This is about looking at our schedules to see what's working, or what is possible and what is not. So, um, 
there are definitely going to be um, opportunities for parents and families to weigh in and to give us recommendations as to how they think they might we might make this transition better. We're only at week seven, I think, of the school year, so we're really you know not that far along. So there will be more opportunities for that. But when you look at these working groups, you'll see that a lot of them are kind of internal projects. You're not going to have a group of 50 people, uh, frankly, hammer out the transportation issues for the town. It, it won't work. Um, it would be nice. It sounds nice, but it's not practical. So um, we have these working groups. Uh, our transportation working group is led by Don Fattori, who's our business administrator. She is the most knowledgeable person in the district about transportation. So she is key to have leading up that, um, that group. Um, ele elementary before and after school programming, we identified early on that this is something that's going to be really important. If elementary school, uh, school age students are getting out earlier, what does that mean? How will that impact families? What can we do to provide um, support to families either before or after? Will we still need before school care? which we provide now. Will we still use precess before school? So that's really the, the role of this committee looking at that. Secondary school schedules led by Scott Kellett, our middle school headmaster who you just heard from, and Ann Deaver Keegan, who is our assistant prince, uh, headmaster at the high school. This is a big deal. When we're changing the start times and the, and the secondary schools are getting out later, and we all know what happens in the fall, we lose daylight. They have to think long and hard about how we're going to make it all work. So our administrators at the secondary level are the most logical people to have in this role. And so um, obviously Scott and Ann are not working in isolation. They're working with uh, Stephen Robleski, our middle school headmaster, and of course John Smith, our high school headmaster. Uh, secondary before and after school programming is being led by John Smith and not, again, not in isolation. Um, those of you who know anything about school schedules, and so I speak to both those bullets, secondary school schedules and secondary before and after school programming, that's a really complicated process. Very, very, very complicated and not easily um, rolled out. You have multiple stakeholders. You certainly have students, you, you have teachers. And you have parents who want to weigh in on what those schedules are going to look like and are my children going to get the most meaningful education possible. So this is a really um, difficult and um, challenging process. So I, I just have to say that because I'm, I've been very impressed with the work that's been done thus far. Uh, the next bullet, staff implications, uh, is being led by, again, Stephen Robleski, our assistant headmaster at the middle school, and Kate McCarthy, our new director of student services. Um, who has a great lens coming from an entirely different district. It's been very helpful. Um, and we, uh, we need to hear from the staff. How is this going to impact you? And is there, is there anything that we as a district can do to uh, ease uh, your transition to this new, uh, these new schedules? And finally, communication being led by Amanda Brown on our um, school committee from Sherburn and Sarah Wilson, a parent in town. Um, Michael Jaffe is not on this list. He's obviously been a huge uh, participant from the very start and has essentially co-chaired both uh, the original Start Times Task Force and the Start Times Task Force Phase 2. So I'm sorry I didn't find a place for you, Michael. It's just your role has been too big. <laughs> um, so, um, so I want to talk briefly. There are 12 slides, so I'm going to try and move as quickly as I can. But with regards to transportation, I just want to tell you the steps that we've taken so far and the decisions that we've made to date and the next steps. I will preface this by saying we're going to be con uh, continuing these report outs um, four times this year. So the, the first um, slide here talks about the steps taken, implemented a new arrival target times for FY20 to tighten overall travel schedule and incorporate shortened time before bell into student and staff morning routines. Essentially, what we've tried to do is exactly what we said we were going to do last year. We're trying to find efficiencies. And to some degree, we've been successful. And in some instances, not so much. For example, we had buses dropping kids off here at the region at 7.10 in the morning for a 7.40 start. That seemed kind of early. 
So we said, no, don't do that anymore. So they came at the time we told them to come, which brought them right directly into the, the traffic jam at the region. So we didn't save any time. So that is part of our challenge. We live 20 miles from Boston. There's a lot of traffic and it's not getting any easier with Waze and Google Maps. People have found the ways around the lights. Um, so, but this was part of the transition is finding out where the efficiencies are now, not next September. <coughs> so I give Don a lot of credit for that. Streamline the protocol for stops to reduce overall route travel time. Sometimes a few neighbors can move to one spot. And um, we recognize that sometimes that will be inconvenient. Um, I know this has changed through the years. When I was a boy in Sherburne, the bus went all the way up the street at one time because somebody must have complained and it went all the way up with the street. It couldn't turn around in the turnaround and eventually they decided it was a bad idea and everyone had to walk to the, you know, the junction of the two streets. This happens in schools. We're actually looking at that to see if there's any travel time that could be saved. Again, the, remember the goal of saving travel time was really about getting those elementary start times earlier. That was the point. If we, later, later. Sorry, later. later. <laughs> From 7.50, the goal was always to try and get closer to 8 o'clock. Um, begin educating bus drivers on the importance of this initiative. They have to be brought into the loop. Mm -hmm. Sometimes places will go forward with something like this and never have the conversation with their bus drivers. It's a big mistake. So, um, and then initiated discussions with the Boston bus company to, to, to see if there's a possibility of us running two morning routes beginning in FY20. Because we want our Boston students to receive the same benefit as our Dover and Sherman students. And um, this has not been finalized, but we are, we are definitely looking at this and, um, and we're still confident. Uh, so next steps on transportation, begin working on a draft, trans on draft transportation schedules for next year, including test runs of the flipped travel routes to better understand travel traffic patterns. So we need to kind of practice these routes. We need to go through them to see what it will look like at these different times. For example, those of you who drive up Bid Bridge Street in the morning from mm -hmm. Sherburne know that you can lose 12 minutes there on the way over to the high school. but if you come by around 10 after eight, you might be the only car up there. It just, it's these shifts. We need to, to know these for sure more definitively. So that's something <coughs> we wanna to continue to work on. Review schedules with both towns, police and highway departments for input on any logistical issues and potential assistance that they might be able to provide. Some have asked, what if you had, um, um, some kind of traffic control, not necessarily lights, but a, perhaps an officer directing traffic in some of our intersections, would it make a difference? They're good questions. So we need to work collaboratively with them and that we're not done yet. Um, so elementary before after school programming, steps taken and decisions made so far. We've held met meetings with community ed. They're the ones who run our Dita Shida and park and rec directors regarding after school programming. Existing programming, how will this be impacted? Are there benefits? Are there possible benefits to this? Uh, community education, you know, we've made the decision that we will uh, expand DITA and SHEDA, the before and after school care programs at the elementary schools to align with the new times to, um, to accommodate our families. Um, we've made the decision that our high school, uh, that our school advisory councils, which have parent uh, members on them, We'll, we'll hear the parent input and seek to address the concerns. They're the most logical organization within any school, believe it or not. Um, your school site council, they're called different things, with these advisory councils, they're intended to capture the voice of parents. That's where parents have the principal's ear and, um, and they're intended to influence um, the, the, the policies. Um, so next steps with this group, continue working with these directors and community ed on logistical changes, continue to work with Start Times ca uh, Task Force Communications Group to inform the community of the change in the Start Times because some aren't keeping uh, an eye on that and also the anticipated impacts. Uh, for example, we have heard uh, in one of the neighboring communities that made this change that they didn't anticipate that elementary families might drop off more. So we have to factor that in. Uh, that could change the look of things. 
we want to anticipate where we can and, um, and address those issues in advance instead of waiting until the fall of 2020. So the secondary school schedules, um, this has been, uh, as I said before, a very, very big and challenging task. Um, but to date, um, they've uh, developed multiple scheduling options for both schools, uh, conducted faculty information sessions and surveys, uh, and determined final options for both schools. So right now they have two proposals that they've put together, two for the high school and one for the middle school. The middle schools is not dramatically different than it is, but it has had um, some adjustments. Uh, they're not done. It's not, comp I, you know, we say final, we believe these are the best options and the final options, but there still may be tweaks because it's still being discussed. Again, it's, we're in the sixth, uh, seventh to eighth week of school. So, um, but we think that those options are, are close. Uh, so next steps, faculty feedback, feedback and input on these um, schedules, student focus groups feedback input on these schedules at the high school, uh, make recommendations uh, slash decisions uh, on the final high school schedule and establish working groups to address the new mm -hmm. schedule. For example, uh, X block working group. So, um, uh, one of the challenges uh, that we know that exists for the high school is, in fact, that our students get extra help from uh, roughly 2.20 to 3 o'clock, John? Yes. So that's about a 40-minute window, maybe 45. The question is uh, that John has been uh, and Ann have been discussing with uh, the teachers and the kids is, does it need to be that long? Does that window of time need to be that long? And if, in fact, everything's bumped out later <coughs> and our league competition, half have early start times, half do not. If our kids have to compete with other schools that don't necessarily have these later start times, are, we, are they gonna be clamoring to get out of school to get to their competitions in Westwood or Bellingham or Norton? So. Um, the X block is something that they've been considering, which would be a, t a period of time and a relatively short period of time, but a period of time for extra help for students, but it would also allow for other possibilities as, as well, um, perhaps advisory, which is something that we've been talking about for a long time. Um, a lot of different possibilities. So John is looking at that X block uh, and Anne and the high school folks are looking at that X block and, and trying to see if it will work for them. It's a work in, pro and in, uh, in process. So um, it's not done. The secondary before and after school programming, same thing. Um, I'm just gonna kind of move a little more quickly here. Will we have um, extra help before school? The decision's been made that we will not. So that makes the, um, or clubs before school. Um, I think John could speak for himself, obviously, but the feeling is that in order to make this work, we need to honor the-, the Yes, yeah, certainly during the first year, Dr. Kia, we need to ensure that we're looking at the sleep patterns, we're looking at our attendance, our tardies, we're looking at performance in first period, second period classes. And my concern would be if we allowed for some early extra help, it would be a slippery slope and we would see more and more of people saying, well, maybe this group can also meet or to have a club meeting. And it seemed to sort of fly in the face of the idea that we're trying to get our kids to get some additional sleep. That being said, we know that one of our um, neighboring schools, Weston, has implemented something where one day a week they do allow for an AM um, help session because the culture at the high school, there is some real positivity to having some before school help. So it's a, it's a fine balance, but we do want to take that first year to simply examine how is that extra sleep impacting our kids uh, and then can make decisions moving forward. Thank you. Um, so the same thing, clubs will still begin at the end of the day. Um, uh, allowing students to participate in new cl in clubs as well as drama and athletics. Um, new start of interscholastic athletics and drama programming will be 345. That's a big difference. 
uh, expectation set for ending practices no later than 545 on non-contest days. There were multiple conversations that have gone on around this. This was not just, this is not something the administration just says, you know what, we're changing the practice times because you have multiple coaches mm -hmm. who frankly are competitive people and they, they know that the kids care about the competition and they want to remain competitive. At the same time, we are trying to take care of the well-being of our, <clears throat> our kids. It's a priority for this district. So those are long conversations, but I appreciate the fact that they did get to a, a commitment of uh, no later than 545 on non-contest days, and sometimes it will be earlier than that. Um, so next steps, depending on the existence of this flex block at the end of the school day, uh, 30 additional minutes of extra help would be sufficient. Otherwise, we may need to push the start of drama and athletic programming to 4 p.m. So staff implications, we, um, Kate and Stephen have been meeting with faculty, will continue to meet with faculty. We're hearing their ideas and their recommendations and we're, we're doing what we can to see what we can do to, to ease this transition for our faculty. Um, one thing we know is that they do want specifics around before and after school requirements. Uh, they want to know, are we uh, going to allow extra help or clubs uh, before school? They want to know, will we have faculty meetings before school? These are things that need to be processed. We know it. They've been identified and they need to be worked out. Um, and finally, communications. The communications group has really, uh, they have done an amazing job. I would like to recommend that anyone, if you haven't been on the SAR Times Task Force, um, web page in the past uh, week you should go and visit because they have done a great job of keeping that updated. You should also follow them on the Twitter feed which is at D S uh, at DS Z three Z's three Z's. Um, the they've updated the Start Times Task Force on lo local and national start time developments, which we appreciate. Drafted the newsletter and e-blast content, and as well as press rela uh, releases. Unfortunately, there was not an article written about this last spring. That surprises me, but um, we submitted uh, an article to the local paper this um, fall to let them know what happened. Uh, much appreciation for for taking the time to do that. Um, and then maintaining the Start Times Task Force email account, which is still out there. And that is uh, school start times. Uh, start time at doversherburn.org. Thank you. School start time at doversherburn.org. Um, next steps, we obviously, they uh, are going to support the, the phase two task force um, as needed. We would like to plan some community education events perhaps some events around sleep hygiene, how do people make this adjustment, uh, see if we can get some experts in to talk about how do people um, work uh, to change schedules for younger children in particular. Um, and then um, facilitate outcomes uh, measurements. So a quick review of the start time I mentioned earlier, the work we did, it really should go back to 2015 the vote in uh, last April, and then the work we've been doing this year. We will continue to provide updates, as I mentioned, on January 14th, uh, on April 7th, and on June 11th. Uh, and as necessary, uh, again, our rollout is uh, planned for 2020. So before I go to questions, I do want to thank all of those folks that I listed before who came out tonight, not only for the Finland presentation, but for this as well. And uh, I may um, defer to them if, if uh, the school committee has questions that I can't answer. Okay. Okay, so first, before I don't turn it over to school committee questions and then public comment, um, I wanted to thank Michael for heading this up a couple of times. Um, it's been a lot of work, I know. And I also, so Amanda Brown is part of the communications. So I wanted Amanda to, um, if you wanted to express um, what some of the sites are they can go to. I know Dr. Keogh just told them, um, but that way, because you, you, there is a lot out there. It's just getting the information out. Yes. So if you want to go ahead and then I'll take questions from school committee and then we'll go to public comment. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to sort of reiterate some of the things that Dr. Keogh said. Um, as you heard from this presentation, um, 
was is an incredibly complex issue. So once you start changing start times, you're talking about everything. It touches everything. And the decision the school committee made last spring, it was a 14-0 vote um, to change the start times, was made after a year of really thoughtful research into um, the science, into what other districts were doing. Um, we had um, a lot of outreach through surveys and face-to-face -face meetings with a variety of stakeholders to figure out what the impacts would be on our students, um, on our staff, and our, on our families. Um, the process was transparent, inclusive. You can read sort of everything we did um, on our website, which you can link to through the Dover Sherburne Public Schools. Um, I think it's also important to note that there was elementary school representation on that original start time task force, um, and there continues to be elementary school representation on the start time task force in its current um, form. Um, at the heart of the process from the very beginning was the health and well-being of all of our kids. Um, in terms of where you can find out more about what we discovered, um, research FAQs we've put together, you can get to the, the web, Start Time website through the Dover Sherburn site. Um, there's lots of sub tabs on the left that will lead you in different directions. Um, you can also link directly to our Twitter from that. Um, and we continue to push out things um, to do with the latest research, um, sleep hygiene, for all of us, not just for our kids. Um, there's a lot of research about grown-ups and sleep as well. Um, so I encourage you, if you continue to have questions after this evening, to check out some of the work that we've done um, to ensure that people are educated about the process that we went through and what we found out. So school committee, any questions from you to our committee or to any of the administrators who are here that could answer? Question on uh, extended day. Yes. So, with the earlier release, uh, do you think we'll see more parents looking to use extended day? And you know, currently, right now, speaking for Pine Hill, it seems to fill up it does. every year. Yeah, that's absolutely. So, will they be looking to expand the numbers so that it will allow for more? Dr. Brown still to, here? Did she? I can, I, I, I can yeah. gladly answer yeah. that. I can yeah. You want to take that? There's also potentially a cost right. with yeah. that, too. So I asked the same question of Allison Gillensworth, who's sort of heading that up for. Um, Allison, right here. She's here. Oh, here. oh you answered it. Awesome. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's something we're definitely taking into consideration, and we actually have Laura and I have a meeting set up this week. Um, and one of the things we talked about from the very beginning is that we're going to need to expand those programs because there's likely going to be um, a larger need for um, for that care after school. So that's upping some um, staff and making sure that um, we can support students who need that after school care. Just to follow up on that, is it possible in your deliberations to also consider like a t I don't know how it is now, but a tiered pricing system? So for families, like just because as a person who historically was able to pick up by four, like it's a lot to sign on for like care that could go to six. Sure. Yeah, okay. I think that's a mere considering more. Um, something that we've um, definitely already brought up and kind of been talking about with them. Okay, for sure. I think that'd be really important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the the uh, before and after school care is actually run by uh, community education, um, and. Uh, we, we, we have options. It's not like we're out of space. Right. But I think we've tried to maintain the size um, because uh, it, it was perhaps easier for the adults. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know why it, the, it's the size that it is, but I don't think that we can't expand it. I do think that that's possible. I also do think that we can look at the costs and, and restructuring those costs. That said, we're talking about is it 40, 45 minutes mm -hmm. m more um, that people might need where sometimes I think we get into this mindset that it's two hours uh, earlier than and it's really it's 45 minutes but amen points well taken but as like a person who needed just 45 minutes of before school care mm -hmm. when my children went to Chickering and there wasn't before school care like 45 minutes with little kids is like an eternity. Well, and if I need it and then I have to pay for daycare till six o'clock at night, uh -huh. that could actually like really wreck my life. So I just would hope that we would 
like even though it's just 45 minutes like you can't leave a six-year-old alone for 45 minutes so that's a, a big deal get if there are alternative enrichment type activities. yeah right yeah. okay yeah you know how to make that good downtime yes yeah. so um and that has been discussed within the start times task force phase two so um because things like this actually create opportunities that we don't want to miss um uh, we do have a bit of a challenge. We're not going to be able to run late buses out of the elementary schools uh, very easily because those buses go and pick up the secondary mm -hmm. students. That doesn't mean we can't run those things, but it's it's an impediment. Um, so, but but I do think, um, quite honestly, we won't think of everything along the way, but. I, you know, I know that I've mentioned this before that we have um, uh, destination destination imagination mm -hmm. now being run out of people's homes. Uh, some people here, are kids who participate in, in DI, could that be run in the school after school? Does this mm -hmm. pr provide that kind of opportunity? Um, perhaps uh, some of that experiential learning that that Beth is talking about that is not necessarily so rigidly constructed but is still incredibly important outdoor activities mm -hmm. there are definite possibilities again some of this has to uh, percolate from the ground up uh, as Michael found out in one system they said oh we're gonna need all sorts of before school care and um, so they created it correct which, yeah, in Weston. In Weston. So they created the before school program. For high school and middle school. For high school and middle school, because people wanted to know, mm, are those kids going to need programs? So, and you found? Mm, two or three families signed up. Right. So, you know, sometimes you think you know what's going to happen, and we don't. So, but I, I do want to uh, emphasize that we have a really open mind on the possibilities for that window of time after school. School committee, anybody else? Um, I don't know. Uh, wait, wait one second. I'm going to do the public comment now. I was closing it to the school committee. And then I'll. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, measuring effectiveness of the change once it's made? So, yes. So, um, actually, uh, we have. Uh, been contacted by a gentleman, uh, a Dr. Matthew Weaver, who is uh, um, epidemiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and is a uh, medical um, instructor uh, at Harvard Medical School, and he's very interested in this uh, this topic, very interested in potentially uh, uh, conducting an evaluation of the impact. Uh, so. It's in its early stages. We had some other possibilities that we were looking at before. He seems very, very interested and is going to um, be back in touch with me. So, thanks. Okay, so with that being said, we're going to open it to public comment. And since there's so many, what I would ask is if we could keep your public comments to two to three minutes, state your name, and we'll call on you and try to not repeat, like if you tag onto something and ask something else, but let's try to keep it in a streamlined manner. Yeah, and your address, obviously, your name and address. It's just like town meeting all over again. Yeah. Okay. No, just have to be town, it doesn't have to be address. No, not address, just town. town yeah. Go ahead. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Rob Andrews. I live at 35 North Hill in Dover. Um, I have two kindergartners. Um, so I'm glad you started off the presentation about Finland, about the well being of parents and families, and that kind of framed how I was thinking about this. And I think that, um, and also, uh, Prior to being a stay-at-home father, I worked in uh, high schools, so I understand and applaud the idea of moving um, start times for high school students. As a parent of two five-year-olds, I am really struggling. Um, and I stay at home, so it's not going to affect me in like, I'm going to probably end up driving my kids to school. I'm scared of the parking lot when mm -hmm. that happens. Um, I'm really struggling because I am very strict about bedtime. And I see this as a challenge in the morning. Um, I'm very nervous about my kids. They already are the first ones on the bus now. Um, I'm worried about sitting in the dark at the bottom of our driveway. If we now have to move to our neighbor's house, which live on a 
street with no street lights, no sidewalks. Um, that worries me too. Um, I just don't think that there's, I, I don't really understand why this is about the whole system when we are in a re resource rich community and we could very easily talk about, in Dover at least, going to town meeting and asking the town for more money for busing for us to all start at the same time. And I really want to urge the Dover School Committee for Chickering to think about that option because I really think that the people that have parents, or pe parents of kids in Chickering would work very hard to get that funding so that we could have buses for everyone to start at the same time and our kids wouldn't suffer. And I've talked to a lot of parents on playgrounds, very nervous parents about their kids and what it's gonna affect their family time, quality of family time, all the things that you talked about, the Finnish culture that we're now looking towards, really value. Um, I think we value it too. And I really don't wanna give up any family time. And my husband leaves um, at six in the morning. So they're, and they go to sleep at seven. So we have very, we have a sliver of time now. And I, I just don't wanna, I, I just, I, I really, I really wanna encourage the school committee in Dover to think about have, putting this to the community um, for, for the whole community to think about the well-being. And, and I, I, I appreciate that we're, we're across the river with our friends, but I, I'm, really, I'm really concerned about, we have resources in Dover that we should be discussing as a community on how we spend those resources. We argue about a $600,000 ambulance. We argue about $6,000 for a newsletter for this Council on Aging. We should have a public debate and discourse about maybe a million dollars for buses I, I think that's just really right by our kids and our community and our parents and what we're trying to do. Hi, uh, Lula Fan, 3 Edge Water Drive in Dover. I've lived in Dover since 2007. And I heard mentioning earlier that elementary school representation was present during this decision making process. And Dr. Keo, I did send you an email, which I, back in April or May when the decision was made, I never heard back from you. And as a working mom of little twins, um, it's very difficult because they do go to DITA for after school. I try to pick them up right after work. Even this evening, I Jennifer saw me eat my dinner in the car so I can be here right at seven. And certainly disappointed because I think the majority of the audience are parents of the elementary schools who really wanted to have an rich discussion of this topic, which has been such a pain point. And for me, when I pick my children up at six, I have to go home, cook them dinner, feed them, try to get 20 minutes of reading, try to do a little bit of piano, learn sight words, and to get them to bed by 8.30, they're not gonna get enough sleep to make this new bus pick up time. Um, the style knows of my kids. One of my child was gravely sick last year. So I've been in touch with the neurologists, with the pediatricians who all share the concern that this change with the schedule of a working mom is really not ideal and certainly disappointed because I've been a long-term resident of Dover and really look forward to enjoying my tax dollars into the school system just to learn that one year in when they start um, their first grade now, that this drastic change is gonna be devastating to my family and many of the family members that are here this evening. Thank you. Since I have my children. Go ahead. And we have been waiting. Could you please yep, go ahead. my piece? Thank you so much. So I wanna back up. Can you say your name, please? Yeah, your name my and- My name is Mary Godwin. I live at 73 Old Orchard Road in Sherwood. I have a second grader and a kindergarten. And I have some serious concerns about elementary school students under this new plan. So when I sent emails, I too haven't gotten responses over and over again. I filled out the survey. I did everything I could not to show up at a meeting like this tonight with my children. But since I wasn't being heard at all, I didn't even get dinner. We just had to come quickly because my children are in X day at Pine Hill, which by the way is excellent and they love it. But most of the parents as I look down that X day pickup sheet come between five and six o'clock to pick up their kids. 
So that means that kids the next day and other daycare systems, they don't get out. They don't have the benefit of that 215 release time so that they have more time after school. They just really have an extra hour at school and one hour less at home by the time you drive back and forth. So if they're not asleep by 8.30, we walk in the door at 6.15, 6.30. It is cramming dinner down their throats, getting them in the bath, maybe being able to read a story. So they're not so exhausted that next day. And I looked at the survey, 30%, between 12 and 30%, of the people survey, people survey, who went to the trouble to fill this out, and that's all we know about on this survey. They said they are going to have to change or modify their child care to accommodate these changes. And I just want to bring you your attention to the last question on the survey, question 20. Question 20 begins, and it's a very long, it's a paragraph, this question. So I'll just read the first line, the first sentence. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the Centers for Disease Control recommends start times of 8.30 a.m. or later for middle and high school students, citing insufficient sleep as a public health epidemic. Then it goes through all the research about why this is so important for middle and high school students. The actual question says, would you support having start times that are in better alignment with the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation. But what it doesn't say is what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation is for elementary school students or what the CDC says. So I did a literature search. I never heard of J Judith Owens and she did not show up in an academic article that has been written in the last five years on this topic. But I could hardly find any research, which is probably why you don't get a recommendation. The research I found, three articles, and the most recent one, what they said is that elementary school students suffer as well with early times. And the researchers suggested that rather than solving sleep deprivation, what we're doing is transferring it to an earlier population, a population of parents like me who don't get to come to these meetings, who try calling and try emailing and try saying, look, my kid's going to be at school for 10 hours if you do this. And we're basically ignored. So I would like to know what research we're going on, because the way you ask this question is really misleading. It really sounds like everybody is saying this for everybody, and that's not what they're saying. There's not enough research to conclude that we're not putting a burden on our elementary school students. So I would just say, instead of roaring forward, we should be waiting. Research needs to be done, and if you have research I haven't seen, I'd love to see it, but I didn't see one citation on that survey. Thank you. Your name, uh, I'm please. Dan Kahn. I live at 33 Tubrecht Drive in Dover. And I'd like to add uh, uh, two things. I echo all the comments to date. Indeed, the peer reviewed literature is very sparse on the effects uh, for elementary school students. Um, there's one study uh, in which two papers have been written in a peer reviewed journal. I have a copy, if anybody would like to see it, uh, by Dr. Keller, that makes two conclusions. One, is that in a study of over 700 elementary schools, there is an association between earlier start times and increased behavioral problems in the elementary schools. Uh, the second conclusion is that it's an inadequately studied field. Um, I work in a scientific organization. When we make decisions, we always want to know what we know and what we don't know, and we want to make sure that we don't step into a very dangerous unknown field uh, with unknown negative consequences. Uh, second, I recall from the meeting in the spring that there was some discussion around a constraint in the ability to source additional bus drivers. Um, I spoke with the CEO of Conley yesterday, and he certainly does not share that concern. Uh, he said, yes, it is hard to recruit bus drivers, but with time, of course, we serve our customers. 
So I wouldn't want to go on, we can't get more buses as a constraint because all of the negative issues that you present, you covered in your presentation, of which there are many, um, many fundamentally come down to the fact that we have buses driving for an hour or more to get kids to school and they have to do it twice. So that sounds like one of the major variables to address to achieve uh, the important goal of getting the high school and middle school to start later without passing uh, the challenge onto our elementary school students. Thank you. Thank you. Behind you. <clears throat> Rory Glazeman at 10 Pleasant Street in Dover. Um, I have a kindergartner in uh, Chickering and a six month old that we hope will go through the entire school system. So we're in for the long haul. Um, you know, one of the reasons we moved to Dover is we love the idea of, um, I never had this as a child, but the bus comes and picks up my daughter in our driveway. It's awesome. It's wonderful. Um, in, in fact, the student across the street uh, who's in second grade comes across the street and they play and, and they go. But <clears throat> with the start time changing and it'd be, you know, we're getting into fall, daylight savings, it's going to be darker. I can hear the coyotes outside. We all have them in this area, right? We like them. Uh, there's limited uh, visibility and inclement weather coming. And uh, Lieutenant Mio of the Dover Police Department often parks his car in my driveway because I want him to stop speed <laughs> speedsters on my road, which I'm very grateful for. But I'm a little concerned about having five-year-old children on Church Street, Pine Street, Pleasant Street, my street, in the dark, snow coming, rain coming, leaves coming, uh, and, and the wildlife out there. <laughs> have you guys, you know, it's more of a double question, but have you guys thought about that? Are working with the public safety of the police department, those kinds of things seem to be need, need to be addressed. None of us wants an incident before school begins. We agree. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, I just wore a couple things down. Remind me of your name again. I'm sorry. Oh, it's John Kuby, 11th John. stage coach sorry. in yeah. Dover. My son Nicholas is in high school, and my daughter Abigail in uh, elementary. Um, you know, uh, the talk was the decision has been made. Um, did I miss the vote on this? Um, was there a vote taken or something? <laughs> there, there was. There, by, was. By, there was a vote taken, yes. By whom? It was a school committee vote of all three. Okay, so it wasn't by the, the population. It, it wasn't a town vote, no. <laughs> right, because I don't think anybody here wants the early start time. What is your, what is your comment, Mr. Kubula? Is there okay, anything? So the, the comment like is, comment. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we talked about uh, Dr. Judith Owens. Does she have kids in elementary school? Because, you know, you talked how great this whole early start time was, and then you talked about the, the great school system in Finland. Uh, what time are their start times? <laughs> you know. We looked it up. Yeah. Well, Nine o'clock. Yeah. Nine o'clock. They go to school four hours a day in elementary school. So. Right. Uh, our kids in school need to be. Our kids in high school need to prepare to either go to college, then go into a workforce that starts or should start earlier to miss the rush hour. You're starting kids in high school now later. They got to prepare for the real world. Okay, all of a sudden they go out of high school, they're in the college. Well, no, college starts at seven in the morning. Whoa, I can't make it up for seven in the morning. Didn't work start. I mean, I start at work four o'clock in the morning just to miss the rush hour. And I sleep in the car a half hour. So, you know, I, I, I just can't take the traffic. Uh, uh, and you mentioned traffic control. That would be great. Uh, time the lights so when you're sitting at a traffic light with 100 cars behind you, the light next up turns red so the cars can't even go. That traffic control would be ideal. When someone pushes the pedestrian button and the whole world stops all four ways of traffic, that just creates total gridlock. I mean, we definitely need you know, traffic control for sure. Um, uh, you know, 
with the gridlock, and you, you talked about the, the great person from Finland that, you know, she's talking about the green stuff and every, all of that. That's great, but with the gridlock, the car's backed up like that, just sitting at idle. That's the worst pollution coming out of a car when they're sitting at idle. You know, maybe that's something we can fight for. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, but like I said, I don't think there's a person here that wants their elementary school to start 45 minutes earlier. I mean, I have a hard enough time getting my little firecracker out of bed to start at 830. You, know, you light her a wick too early in the morning, forget it. You know? Thank you. And I apologize if I, I tend to talk too loud. I'm not That's yelling. Okay. Thank you. Okay? Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Jeff Ulrich, 35 Hartford, uh, in Dover. I have one daughter in elementary school and uh, one that's going to join in two years and go through the ranks. Um, the site has a lot of great information, and obviously it's very or heavily weighted towards the adolescents and, and secondary education. And I'm curious, you know, all of the position papers uh, speak to, you know, this benefit of a later start time, helping to improve certain things like GPAs, complex problem solving, um, you know, uh, homework completion, uh, you know, it improves tardiness or, or absenteeism. It helps to reduce mental uh, uh, health issues. It helps to reduce stress, um, disciplinary issues, and so on. And so my question is kind of two parts. But the first is, in the research that's been done since that 2015 final report, which made a re recommendation not to change the start time, what have we seen in Dover in your research to indicate that there's been some change in one of those areas or some of those areas that warrants or gives us conviction that we need to change the start times now? Um, and the reason why I ask that question is because I'm curious, what are the benchmarks that we're setting to measure success going forward, not just at secondary levels, but also at elementary levels? I, I, I I was not on the committee for that research. So what I can tell you is we've we've been researching this since 2015. I, I don't think anything has changed to make it more necessary or less necessary. We were still going forward. And so the decision was made to go forward, and now we're in the implementation process. So what are our benchmarks going to be? Well, we're going to implement and see, you know, how how we track and how we how we are handling this. It's not um, but what are we trying? What's the what's what's the objective? I guess like, the objective is them? for better a better well-being for our students. That's yeah, the, the only outcome. Students, because exactly because there's a ripple effect, and we, it was touched upon that you know this touches everything, and and we're talking about young kids that you know ultimately have no say. They you know they they're out of heart direction, and you know forcing them to bear the brunt I think is I think unfair, especially if. Our high school level kids, our secondary you know, secondary schools are performing at an elite level, which based on Boston Magazine has happened for the past at least three years. So I'm just curious why we're pushing this this it's issue of yeah, why they're the guinea pigs exactly. And I'm, I'm I'm wondering what we're seeing in the research because clearly there's been a lot of work done, and I think it would just be helpful for all of us to understand, you know, to what extent that research indicates, other than these surveys results, which I think are probably a little misleading. And how this will benefit the little kids. Yeah. Okay. Or frankly, how it benefits everybody. Okay. You know, because Thanks. it is a broad, it's, it's, it's got a ripple effect that, that to me is maybe even irreversible, especially in our kids who are, who are going to be bearing that front. Let me take the gentleman back there. He's had his hand up. Yeah, hi, Wherever. Rick Aaron, 28 Valley Road. Um, I have to admit, I, you know, hearing about the transparency and the surveys and all this, young mom who had a child in her hands, I couldn't help but think about all the children we see every day, especially to get into preschool. My wife and I own that preschool. We are the largest preschool in Dover. And since 2015, we haven't heard anything. Nobody contacted us, nobody asked us. I have four school districts, public school districts I have to deal with. And I can tell you the families in Medfield, Westwood, and Needham are just as anxious about this as the families we're dealing with in Dover. And the fact that no one mentioned anything to me. It's the largest preschool in Dover. We have, it's like 60 families here at Precious Begins Preschool. And I'm not saying that, obviously, from what the, this young mother said about the survey being misleading, I really think our focus was on the middle school, high school students. So I think the decision is 
that you made in April was flawed because we weren't represented. These families weren't represented. They weren't heard from. And if you're citing the science of the window for uh, this young age group to start school between the sweet spot, I guess is what the word was used, between 7.30 and 9 o'clock, well, the, uh, 7.30, I'm sorry, and 10 o'clock, 7.30 and 9 o'clock is a sweet spot, then why are we going for the earliest time? And then what about the sweet spot for the older age group, which I think is between 8.30 and 10 o'clock is that window. So that would put them at 9.15. Now, I know what, I know that this ship has sailed. I, I'm all about managing expectations. You already made the decision back in April to not to listen to any of these films that showed up six months ago, including me. So you just, you know, the task force made the decisions. They didn't include everybody. It was certainly geared towards middle school or high school. I mean, I know you talked and you did your surveys and everything else, but I think your motivation was based on a certain group, and I think all these families are being overlooked. And I know that, okay, maybe there's 30% of children who go to bed between 6 and 8 in this age group, and they can handle that earlier start time. But there are plenty of studies out there that say, 66% of these students don't fall asleep till, till after nine o'clock. So what do we do about them? So I don't think enough research was done on this. And again, all these issues that these families are bringing up, we have to think about the children. Well, if you're really thinking about the children and not the student athletes, then you're gonna think about the median in that sweet spot. I'm not saying I'm against a flip, but I, what I'm saying is if you're using science that says 8.30 to 9 o'clock, I mean 8.30 to 10 o'clock is the window for this age group, then you should go towards the median. Why are we going to the early stage? And I think that has to do with student athletes. I don't think it's based on the development of children. I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence here, but I'm all about balancing and looking for a win-win for all families. And I think negotiation is the way to go. I know this is a difficult decision. I know a lot of people put a lot of hours in this. You talked about schedules. Nobody knows schedules like I do. I handle every schedule for my families, and it's not easy balancing what people want and what they don't want, or, or sometimes they have to navigate with people in the summer. I know all about schedules. I'm just saying, I think the decision in April was a flawed decision because not all the data was presented. And I think we've got a whole lot of people in this room that we're gonna make it very clear to you in the next few weeks that their voices need to be heard. Is there any <laughs> from you? Yeah, I'm Paul Smith, uh, 145 Walpole Street in Dover. Um, so first of all, I want to say that my point of view on this has nothing to do with high school. I actually applaud you for doing this for middle school and high school kids. I think that represents that you care about them. This is not about chickering versus the high school. And the fact that you all volunteer and spend your time here means you care a lot about kids. But then you spent a significant amount of presentation sort of subtly saying to us, we thought about the elementary school, we're going to try really hard to move it back, right? And you, and you talked about how all these other parents now drop off more in these places where it starts earlier. You're implicitly saying to us, yeah, we know this is not so sweet for your kids and not so good for little kids. So we're going to try to mitigate that to some extent. And as people who dedicated your time to this and clearly care about kids, is that really one, a hill you guys want to die on? Telling little kids they got to stand outside at 6.50 in the morning in the dark with the coyotes? Like, that to me just makes absolutely no sense. And I'd like to know specifically, why can't we accommodate the children in the middle school and the high school and the little kids? Why can't we just move the whole damn thing back? Is this a money issue? Because I hear buses. I hear buses and I hear buses and give me a break about buses. I moved to Dover to worry about bus costs so my kid can wake up at 5 a.m. to get here to accommodate bus contracts. Absolutely. It's a very frustrating Thank you. I, now I have to say, as I am a working father and my wife works, and I'm proud of the fact that we both work. And this feels pretty discriminatory against us because yeah. because yeah. I'm going to struggle like home like hell to get home to see my kids and put them to bed every night. And if they have to go to bed at 6:45 to accommodate this ridiculous thing, what am I in Dover for? 
right? I mean, I think Pheasanton is an interesting example, and I don't want to be too like blasphemous here, but I think you're going to see a lot of people starting to look at places like Pheasanton if, if you have a school district which doesn't accommodate little kids. And a fundamental question, the one that I really would like an answer to is, why can't you make this good for all the kids? Why just not move it back? Why not leave the start time and move the older kids older later? Why not do it at the same time? Is this a traffic issue? Are we going to pivot? We're going to pick traffic against little kids? These are five-year-olds. They can barely use the toilet. And you're asking them to stand outside at 6.45 in the morning in 20-degree weather when it's dark. And that's devastating to hear from people that I know care about kids. It just feels to me like something that was rammed through. I run a software company for a living. I know how to ram an idea through. And I would strongly recommend you consider what's going on here as elected people. This is a really bad outcome. And it's not necessary. We can support your kids and ours. It doesn't have to be either or. Thank you. So if there's, we understand your comments, uh, and we're taking those into consideration. And if there's no other new issues on the comments. Um, I feel like we could do this. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say if it's, if it's um, you know, if it's anything other I than. I have a comment that's different okay. than what's been raised. I'm Carissa Hayden. I have a little 29 year old with Drive and Dover. I have two daughters that are five and almost three. And I have talked to many of the people at these tables about my concerns in the past. Um, my question tonight it addresses sort of, clearly you have a group of parents here that feel like their very, very real concerns have been both diminished and underrepresented in this process and continuing now. So if you look at the website that is currently up from the Dover Sherburn site on this specific issue, it is immensely biased, and that is something that you can fix now. You can't go back and fix that we weren't included in all of this, but there is not one negative quote on that website. There, we are not being represented in any way. You're just trying to put a good face on this and pass it along. I implore you to try to represent us even in these small ways. Thank you. Um, can we do a vote on this? I mean, there's, I don't think there's one parent here that wants this to start early. So, someone who hasn't spoken um, in the back. <laughs> Um, Valerie Lynn from 14 Pina Terrace. Um, thank you very much for the work that you've all done. I know that this is a really difficult subject, and thank you for all the passion that everyone has. I think that um, uh, it, it's a tough subject. I have a middle schooler, and next year I'll have two elementary schoolers. Um, my question, well, my comment for the middle school is um, my son really used that one hour of after school tutoring. So he took the late bus very frequently. Um, and I feel like that was really important for him as a sixth grader because it really helped boost his confidence as a student. And he had a tough transition going from elementary school to middle school. So that time after school was really important for him. He used it a lot. Um, so not only just as, as a student, but also for his relationship with his teachers. That was really a time where he was able to develop that relationship with his teachers and get some one-on-one -on -one time. So I really hope that um, as, as you move forward with the middle school and the high school that you keep something of that sort in mind, whether it's before school or after school. And I know that the whole initiative is to improve sleep. Um, I'm lucky he's a kid who goes to bed early and gets up early. So I think he will use that time, whether it's before school or after school, if it's made available. Um, and for the elementary school students, um, I really struggle with this. I agree with a lot of the comments that have been said. I feel that it's, um, it's unfortunate that the elementary kids are getting pushed forward. Um, and one of the things that I really want the transportation piece to think about is for a lot of elementary school um, families have kids who are younger than elementary school. And I happen to be one of the families who has to walk to the end of our street. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio when you're doing the split because anybody who has younger kids has to wake them up also and take them with them to the end of the street to the bus or if they have a long driveway. So like for me, if this, if this was already in place, I would be really having a hard time with this because my husband also is on by 6 a.m. And so I, our whole family is walking to the end of the street. The reason it works out now with my middle schooler going early is because he goes by himself with the other group of middle schoolers. So I don't have to wake my girls up to take him, but that would, certainly change next year. And I'm sure anybody else who has young um, children, whether they're infants or preschoolers, um, it, it, for anybody who has to walk to a centralized pickup that we've been talking about for improving the efficiencies of the bus, I really worry that that's a, a, a huge impact on families. 
Gentleman in the back. My name is Moji Davidov. I live in North Fox, Colorado. Well. Just adding a small point to your point, which is all valid, is um, I had a five year old and seven year old, and uh, they, we were talking about helping the high school with the sweet range of the hours they can be in school is important. But remember, middle school and high school, when they drop by bus, they are capable to open the door with the key to get mm -hmm. in. But the five-year-old is not. They are dependent on us in the morning that early or in afternoon we should be there. Otherwise the driver not gonna drop and go. And we have a difficulty in those period. And uh, it would be really, you know, every research has a pro and con. And you decided maybe that helped the high school, who knows, in few years you realize my six-year-old, five-year-old get up at 6, 5.30 a.m. would be struggle through elementary, going to have a weak start in middle school and not going to be. And then here you go again. We need to come up with another idea because I have a difficulty to wake him up at 7. And, uh, and the study shows as a smaller you are, I mean, healthcare, they need to sleep more. As you get older, you don't sleep as much. So these kids, they need to sleep more. And we make him up to get up earlier. And that's difficult. Thank you. Thank you. In the back. Um, my name is Sarah Wilson, and I'm at 12 Church Street in Dover. I'm a chicken and mom of two. Uh, I feel like I should try to put myself out there because I am on the phase two of this darn time task force um, in the communications group. Uh, just hearing the comments, we definitely want to be representative, and hopefully Jennifer knows because uh, Jennifer and I have worked together that we're trying to get quotes that are, are that are factually correct and also um, balanced. So, so I, I just clothes. wanted to so just let me finish. Um, I wanted to introduce myself because I, you know I want you to put the name with the face. I am a chick right mom and. You know, definitely, you know, I, I worked as a school counselor in middle school and high school, so see the reason why we're doing the flip. There's no one I love more than my boys. I want them to get the sleep they need. I am going to be impacted by this change, um, not just next year, but for several years. So I, you know, I'm personally impacted, but I really, I, I really feel like the worst thing we can do is to do nothing. And the, the decision has been made, so I'm definitely, you know, on board with it, but also a chicken and parent. I'm here to hear what you have to say and try to work with the start time task force. So wanted to just introduce myself a little bit and um, hopefully <coughs> I can work together with you and um, hear your voices, get your quotes in there, and try to be representative of what was your name again? Sarah Wilson. Sarah Wilson. Hi, I'm John. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any new information that needs to be expressed? Wait. So, um, I'm Zoe Yu at 17 Chapter Land in Dover. Um, I just want to clarify that uh, I was here for the last committee meeting that um, you guys voted on this topic, and I think as as what I remembered, the what was voted on, what was written in the minutes was. Um, everybody agreed that ele elementary school can be started no earlier than 750 and high school can be started no later than 435 which gives us a lot of options to work with for example the high school can start at 815 and the elementary school can start at 845 which still fits in that voting right. so, it's so we have a lot of options we can talk about it's it doesn't have to be the flip option it can, I mean just like everybody said it could be win-win for every kid in town I just want to make that. Did I remember correct or did I remember wrong? Well, I just want to double check with you guys. Well, I think we just gave ranges. I'm, I would have to look back at our notes to the exact time, but we gave ranges. She's correct. Yes, no earlier than 7. No earlier than 7. No later than 8.35 a.m. Yeah, no later than 8.35. Yes, in the back. Hi, I just want to, this is Jane Hauser, 22 Rowling Lane. I just want to say that I was at some of those meetings last year, and I just, I do really appreciate the work that you've done. I think this is an amazing decision for middle school and high schoolers. I do not think that it was inclusive of all of the elementary school kids. 
I, at those meetings last year, it was very uncomfortable being a member of the public because it was clear that the ship had already sailed before the vote even took place. And by the looks of you know some of the people, the science was there, no doubt. I can't question that for the middle school and high schoolers. But it was very awkward being a member here where it was clear that no matter what you said, it was happening. And so I would just ask you to reconsider the options that might be available to us. I'm all in favor for this benefiting the middle schools and high schools. I can't wait till my kids are there and can benefit from it, but it is going to be utterly painful in the meantime. The other thing that I would say is that, and I know I'm always like the special education mom who brings things up to the school committee, but <clears throat> I don't know, I would be very curious as to what kind of transitions and transition plans you're making for all of the elementary school kids, the kids who are on IEPs, the kids who are on 504s, who have a really hard time with transitions anyway? That's one question, but look at some of the research with any kid with ADHD, any kid with autism, any kid with anxiety, or any other kind of psychiatric disorder. The circadian rhythm disruption to them is pretty bad. So I would suggest that that gets looked at, a plan gets put in place like ASAP for these kids because they don't turn quickly. And then, um, I mean, I, I am very, very thankful for the research. I think it was very thorough on the middle school and high school front, but it's just, it needs a little bit more work for everybody else. Thank you. Yes. I just have one thing to say, and it may have just been your name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Jennifer James, okay. and I'm seven chapter late. Okay. About um, the work that Sarah and I had done together, uh, I've been asked to collect positive and negative quotes about how parents were feeling about this. I submitted one positive quote, and everyone was very excited about it. it was posted, and then I posted, I submitted a negative quote, and there was all this pushback about the quote that was given by the parent not being factually correct and the, the research that she was quoting. It seemed like there was a lot of pushback for that. But even before that, I had submitted it and then I was told that the committee was disbanded because um, it was being taken in by the administration. And then I pushed back and I said, well, is this happening or not? Can you give me some more information about it? And then I got some pushback about that particular quote. And my feeling was that even if there's some errors there, it's a person's um, opinion and I didn't feel it was my place to correct it or, or look into it if that's how a parent is feeling. So if we are going to have a communications committee, maybe we need to be a little bit more um, in line with what the guidelines are. I mean, maybe it was just miscommunication, but it felt to me that when I put forth a positive quote, it was great. And then when I put forth a negative quote, there was a lot of pushback about what the quote said. And, and you know, it, felt, it just felt like, Again, if we're going to cherry pick quotes, then I don't want to waste people's time if we're not going to do this yeah. where everyone's quotes from. Just to clarify one thing. So the flip is like the decision. Is that correct? The start time is is changing. That's the decision. OK, so, but the flip isn't set in stone in, in, in terms of your mind. In, in, in well, no, I mean, that's what the start time change is. So we're making an earlier time for oh, I one. I saw three scenarios. One was a shift, one was a flip, right. one, one was a uh, one run. So the, the, yeah, the and flip the, the, is the flip decision. was right. Does everyone know why it's just the flip and not another option? like? Uh, I feel like I don't know. I've heard it some of but it's still um, I was still in it, but there was no discussion. But, but maybe, can, can you clarify maybe that point? Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a win-win here. I'm just trying to figure out why we're not taking it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it'd just be helpful to understand. So I, 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 yeah, how do we stop the early start time? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my, that's what my concern is. Chief McGowan will not drag us to jail. We'll change our mind. Okay. So <laughs> I, I, I will, I will respond to your um, question as best I can because it was April 30th, and there have been a few things that have gone on since April 30th. But uh, on that night, the decision that I brought forward was to support the flip uh, model that you saw tonight on the screen. That's the one that I brought forward. So 
all the anger and ire should ultimately be um, directed at me. I brought it forward based on uh, my review of the research, my experience as an educator, my belief in what is ultimately in the best interest of the kids, my 32 years of experience in education, working in other places than Dover Sherburn with very powerful people, I believed it is the right thing to put forward and I still do as a parent who had children who were once three, five, pre-K, kindergarten, first, second, who are now 28, 24, and 20. What time did they grad start? Graduates of Dover Sherburn. I know a different perspective than some people and perhaps it's wrong. I thought the I thought the I thought the, excuse me Sorry. nobody interrupted anybody else commenting please don't I, interrupt a a person sitting up here thank you I do think that the point about um, the Finland uh, message quite honestly having been there and seen it myself so it's not make believe about people trusting the school leaders is an important piece because quite honestly you're going to be looking for new leadership and, and maybe you guys want the job but you will be looking and at some point you need to place your faith in the people who are trained to do this work none of you frankly have my training i'm sorry but that's the truth and you can argue with me and feel free to but that is the truth okay so as far as i'm concerned it was a decision that i brought forward the school committee did ultimately decide to support that decision. I think it was the right decision. I understand that when you're making decisions in systems with 2,000 students, not everybody is going to agree. And you cannot always put it to a vote, Mr. Kuby. You cannot always put it to a community vote. It does not always work that way. Sometimes you charge the leaders with doing the work and to ultimately making a decision. Otherwise, we'll make all decisions by community vote, and we will get nowhere. Sometimes you have to entrust your leaders. And that is what I'm asking for, quite frankly. That's what I'm asking for. If you don't agree with that, that's fine. I'm a Dover Sherburn graduate myself. I spent my entire career watching what happens to kids in systems like this. I've had kids, students that I've lost who took themselves out and I would argue that they were lacking sleep in many instances. And that I hold yeah. myself responsible for. So I will continue to advocate for this model. It is ultimately the school committee's decision but I stand by my my proposal. And I, I listen. I, you know, I'm I, I'm certainly not the scientist that you are. That have done the research of, like you said, the 32 years of experience. I think what I'm saying is, as a parent, I want to trust you. And you you can't just walk into a room and say, well, I've got 32 years of experience. You you can trust me. What I'm looking for is more of an explanation, I guess, why we're looking at changing something like the elementary start time to some an earlier time, the same time that essentially the high school kids are, are going right now that we're looking to push forward without sufficient research to support the positive effects of that happening. Because I, I haven't seen, uh, the website is very robust in, in talking about adolescence. It's nearly quiet, Okay, can, quiet. Can, I, can I respond yeah, to that? Yeah, that's all I'm looking for, okay. just some explanation. So, first of all, it's troubling to me when people come af after this entire process goes through. We didn't, I did not, okay, and I can prove it, did not just kind of pop this out there to the school committee in April of last year. There was a full process and much communication throughout my newsletters, letters home to families to participate in this process. But the decision ultimately was made and all of these things were discussed in this forum. These possibilities were discussed and ultimately many of the comments that have been made tonight were discussed. It's just a matter of going back and checking the videotapes. These things were discussed over and over and over, but at some point a decision had to be made and it was the school committee's decision. I obviously wouldn't have recommended it if I didn't believe it was the best decision for our system, but remember we have 
We have families of all aged <coughs> children, and we have families with all different experiences. For me, going, my children going to school later was a problem. I actually had to stay back as a high school principal to make sure my kids could get on the bus. It would have been better, frankly, for me. That was a long time ago, but it would have been better for me. So every family is a little, little different. We know that. We know that some families, this is gonna be a real burden for. We recognize that. We did look at that data. 30% <coughs> of the families did say it was gonna create a child care issue for them, but 70% said it wasn't. That factors into our, our thinking. We did look at all of that data. We did ask people. We spent a lot of time on this. And now, now we're being told, bad idea, disrespectfully, I might add. Okay, disrespectfully, I might add. Some of the ways that people are carrying themselves, frankly, tonight, are it's not good modeling for their children. And I know something about that too, okay? We should be being disrespectful in this discussion. I mean, should be being respectful, not disrespectful. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. So the decision was made after reviewing these things. That's where we, we ended up. Okay. So is there is there a resource we can go to to see just the recommendation in terms of why the early start time versus another alternative <coughs> like the shift? There is the video from the meetings last spring that you can post it online. Mm -hmm. All, every school committee meeting where this was uh, on the agenda, it was discussed and it was recorded. And by the way, for the record, I'm not saying that this the high school shift, uh, uh, you know, the pushback to start time is a bad idea. I think it's the ripple effect that, that I'm speaking to, and that's what I'm trying to understand is the second part of that, right, which is how does that impact our children? I, 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 so I'm I, not trying to be disrespectful. I, I appreciate that. And, and I, you know, there... When you're making these decisions for a school system and making recommendations for a school system, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people whose lives are impacted. I recognize that. I ultimately have to kind of make what I think is ultimately the best decision. And it's not always an easy decision. If it was, anyone could do this work. It would be no problem. It's usually complicated, which means there's usually two sides, correct? There's usually one side in favor and one side is not. This is not the first time I've been in a position where something was split like this. I recognize it, but that doesn't mean, I mean, what do you want from your leaders? Do you want your leaders to make a decision that they think is absolutely correct and in the best interest of the school system, and then when people push back to just change their position? Or because we did listen, we went through a very thoughtful process and we did a great deal of research. I think if I were in your shoes, especially knowing that uh, many of the administrators work with kids from all different age groups or have over the course of their career, we, went, we, we thought about the whole spectrum. And we recognize it's not perfect. It's not perfect. I, I do not want to claim that this is a perfect solution, but I do think that this is in the best interest of this school system, 100%. All right. Uh, they can let, yeah. let them say. Oh, Go, ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Kahn again from 33 Tubrock, Dr. Keogh. Thank you for the thoughtful response. Um, could you please add a little bit? And I did go back and watch many of the videos from the recorded sessions. I saw the presentation um, from the sleep specialists. All very compelling. Can you talk a little bit more, please, to as a parent of a kindergartner, and I think many others here had not come through that whole process with you. Can you talk a little bit more about the apparent budget constraint? Why can we not, as Paul was talking about, get closer to a win-win for all? So yes, I definitely can. Thank you. So um, your conversation with, who, who was it at Connolly that you spoke with? Uh, the, the CEO, Steve, and I forgot his last time, but I wrote it down in my notes. Okay, well, Steve uh, Sullivan. Steve you, Sullivan. Yes. So that's a different message than we've received. Don speaks with uh, with Steve and Steve, Steve Conley, who's actually the director of operations. So I mean, and I will tell you, we struggle with having bus drivers for our buses right now. Mm -hmm. For one driver. And I've seen right. my personal bus. Yeah, bus seven has cycled through a few times. Correct. Right. That's, a, that's a good example. And it's been. So they were honest really, yeah. with us when we asked. 
if we if we came and gave you a, and we're going out for bid um, in January, if we told you we needed 38 buses, you know, what would you what would you do? And they they were honest and said that would be our, we wouldn't be able to probably to take the contract on. Now you're talking to Steve Sullivan, he was more of the financial guy, not the operational guy. So I understand, you know, they're not going to say no. Um, he seems, seems like he's in sales. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, but it also comes down to um, uh, it, it's that, but also I, it, there is a little bit of financial piece in this because how you know we have a, a set pool of money that we need to do so many things with, and do you want to take a big chunk of it and have just for transportation? I know you say you do, but you've got to look at the bigger town picture too. Um, so I mean. I personally looked at research that said that the elementary kids are hitting walls at 1.30. Mm -hmm. So this would work in favor of them um, do, doing, going the earlier schedule. So I do think there is research out there that all these guys listen to that made us all come to this conclusion. I'll, I'll add also to when, when we were talking with other districts, um, they shared the experience of driver shortages. In fact, there's some districts without changes that have been um, streamlining their routes uh, because they can't get enough drivers to service what they've been doing for years. And so those routes are getting longer because they have fewer drivers that they can, they can bring on. Well, I would certainly implore the committee to put the onus on Connolly and perhaps other contractors to provide whatever it is that we deem would be helpful. And get as much support as is available. Yes. Hi, it's Paul Smith again from 145 Waffle. So you made a good point. What do I want my leaders to do? So I'm a CEO of a company. I am presented with choices all the time, which are unpopular. And you have to make them. And often I'm presented with those choices because I may have constraints, right? I am constrained by something, and therefore I'm choosing between A and B, and therefore I have to choose A, even though I'd love to choose both. But if someone removes a constraint from me, then I can choose both. And that's what we're trying to figure out here. The reason you're getting these questions about the bus contract is if you tell us, hey, the constraint is we can't pay for the buses, well, then that gives us something to try to alleviate to solve the problem. Again, to be very clear, I am very supportive of what you're doing for the middle schoolers and the high schoolers. This is not a commentary on that decision. But I am not supportive, and I think a lot of people are not supportive, of asking little kids to wake up like this. And I, it just stands to reason to me that if it's not good for the middle schoolers and the high schools, it's probably not good for the little kids. And I only know that because as the kids get older, they need less sleep eventually, right? Like, sleep goes down. My kid used to sleep 13 hours. Now, I don't want to use anecdotes as like the rule. But he used to sleep 13 hours, now he sleeps like 10. And I wish, you know, maybe he would stay there, but he's going to go to 9 and then 8. And so the bottom line is, if we can alleviate the constraints for you, please let us know that that's the constraint, right? That what has not come through to me is, is are you making the decision because 70% of the students are in middle school and high school, and therefore it's best for the system because 70% benefit? Or are you making the decision because that's actually better for the little kids too? And if it's not, I'd love to help you alleviate the constraint. And I think all of us would go marching into the selectman's office and trying to get you more money, wherever we can get you the money to try to alleviate this problem. So I'd like to respond to that, if that's OK, Paul. So you know, as somebody who's been in leadership, um, the constraints are not always just a simple matter of moving this constraint. And now you're all set and you can adjust it. It's not that simple. OK, this is a regional system, 6 through 12. But it is not regionalized. K through five. But at the same time, we want equitable experiences for our kids because they come together as one system. We don't want our kids in Dover to have a dramatically different experience than Sherburn. They're both capable of having high powered schools and they've demonstrated that. They both have been incredibly successful, but that's also in part through a concerted effort. The financial pictures in Dover and Sherburn are not the same. Dover's uh, financial uh, situation, their tax rate is probably seven or eight dollars less per thousand dollars than Sherburn's. Sherburn's tax rate is off the charts right now. They don't have uh, the same kind of revenues. They don't have the same kind of safety nets. 
And so we can't just go to them and say, give us more money, because there's no more money to get. And, and along those lines, you do have outstanding teachers here. You have exceptional teachers here, and you pay for them. You pay in the top 10% in the state, easy, if not five. You pay for that, but those are decisions. Those are constraints. We make decisions about where we need to put our resources. And I think that's what Don was saying. You know, the resource, there are limits to how many resources, even in places like Dover and Sherbrooke. We're an outstanding system. This place has been run like a tight ship, if you ask me, as someone who's in his third year. But the fact of the matter is, there's not a lot of wiggle room. There's not a lot of room for a million dollar ask. There just isn't. Besides the fact that just finding one driver, we've lost one driver in Dover this year and struggled. One driver retired. How many buses do we have? We have 19. We have 19. It's, it's not that simple. I get it. I understand the frustration. I also understand the exhaustion of the parent who spoke earlier. I understand that. I absolutely understand it. My children were swimmers, U.S. swimming from seven years old on, bringing them to practices in Framingham and meets and four-day meets and my job. And my wife is a full-time uh, federal employee. We, I get that. I totally get it. It's really, really difficult, especially when the kids are younger. They are more needy when they're younger. They're more independent as they get older, but they're more complex in terms of their kind of social emotional well-being as they get older. That's that's my been my experience. I think that ultimately this is a decision again that's in the best interest of all of our kids. If there is something out there and you have a suggestion, Paul, or somebody has a suggestion on how we would access that kind of money for all of our students, I think that the committees would be interested in that. But I think you'd also find if you watch those tapes, we've talked about it, if you watch how we go through this budget process each year, there isn't a lot of money. There just isn't. That's a myth. Because the money goes, frankly, to paying for what we deem is the most important thing of all our teachers and our facilities. That's the truth. Yes. I just think the trouble that we're having is the decision for the older kids was based on a lot of science and the benefits were for their well-being and their overall health. And the, there hasn't really been an equal representation of that information for the younger kids. It all seems to be about logistics in terms of making the bus schedule work. And that's kind of what we're struggling with because we're worried about our kids. I'll, I can speak to that a little bit. So um, I, um, I'm, I'm Amanda Brown. I've been on the task force from the beginning as a parent last year of a kindergartner, a second grader, and a fifth grader. I now have a middle schooler, um, and we still have a ways to go in the elementary school. Um, I'm a working mom. My husband works in Boston. He has a long commute. We've used early morning care in Sherburn. Um, as have a number of other people. Um, our family is very used to the struggle to ensure that our kids get enough sleep. Um, I think the difference, well, I know the difference from research between the younger kids and the older kids is yes, the older kids need less sleep, but you're not able to manipulate their sleep in the way that you are the sleep of younger children. Um, and so what we know, um, it's absolutely true that the elementary research is not as robust, in part because it's not a public health crisis. Um, so there hasn't been the research into it um, that there is an adolescent sleep. Um, what we know is we know how much kids, how much sleep kids need. Um, we know that their sleep schedules can be manipulated. Um, and we know that there are ill effects if kids aren't getting enough sleep. Um, so as a parent of younger children, I feel um, confident, I think because I've had the experience of really prioritizing my kids' sleep over other things, um, that it can be done. And I don't think it's a given that elementary school kids are going to suffer um, if we flip the school schedules. Um, and I know the communications going forward is really focused on sleep hygiene, on helping families find balance, um, 
we've heard from Challenge Success presentations, I don't know how many people attended the recent Well-Balanced Student presentation, that, that sleep comes first, our kids' physical health comes first, um, and everything else sort of happens around that. Um, I'm also a high school teacher, so I see the other side too. Um, Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Um, thank you so much for making this a school number one or on top of the state. Thanks to all teachers. But at least we hope that you are open to help these little guys, little children. And uh, in any way, you are a smart guy. And I'm sure you can find a way. And you hear the voice of all these people concerned. And that we know you do the best. But I hope you can help this situation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that being said, we're going to move on with the agenda. If anybody wants to stay, you're welcome to stay. If you've heard enough for tonight, <laughs> you don't have to stay. I understand. I did. I, think. I did. I already did. That's it. Okay. So let's keep going. So we're going to start now with the um, staff's report. Ms. McCoy, your assistant superintendent report. So I feel like much of my report has been um, commented on already. I'm happy to take questions. Otherwise, we'll move on. Move on. Dr. Kia. You're talked out. <laughs> you can review Dr. Keo's report, which we are happy to answer. All reviews. Yeah. Okay, so if anybody has questions, you can always email them to your chair yeah. and support them. To Dr. Keo. Dr. Keo. Um, so the only other um, is the approval of the consent agenda for October 1st, 2019. Um, Lynn already commented on that her name was Leslie, no. number four for the okay. policy. Um, she's already told, told Cheryl. Okay. So. Yep, I see it. She is not Leslie. <laughs> um, sorry, Lynn. <laughs> she's still there. She's still on the phone. We're glad you didn't leave us. Um, so is there, are there any other changes that anyone had that we need to address before we vote to approve? I'm going to go first with Sherburn. Um, yeah, I'll go first with Sherburn. So may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda of October 1st, 2019 from Sherburn? Nancy. And second? Mike Fitzgerald. Can I uh, have a motion from Dover to accept the consent agenda as presented in our packet? Leslie. Brooke. Second. Thank you. Uh, Region. So moved. Second. Okay, Judy. Okay. Great. Sherburn, any discussion? That being said, all in favor? Aye. Dover, any discussion? In favor? Uh, unanimous. Okay, Regent, any discussion? On favor? Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Go to sleep. Yes, all right. With that being said, um, we will adjourn. Uh, motion, motion, to motion, motion to adjourn. Session. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Do, you to, do you want to do executive session? It's just a quick update if you want. Oh, right. Do you all want to move to executive session? Uh, you don't want it. There's no real there's thing no, to update. There's nothing to update, I don't no. think. Okay. So, okay. okay, so motion to adjourn. Great. Great.